I don't know where you are. I'm in Cork. I'm in a hotel called the Imperial, and it's a very, very lovely hotel and a lovely room. But I can't control some of the noises, maybe on the street or on the corridor. So forgive me if they happen, because I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you every Friday. And I can hear people in the background myself. But we're here in a room. I don't know where you are, as I say, but you're definitely in the Michael Harding podcast in this moment. Whether you're walking along the beach, on a country lane or up a hill or in the city, whether you're lying down on the bed or sitting in the corner, no matter what you're doing, you're in a room called the Michael Harding Podcast. And that's like a space in your own heart, I would say. Not so much in your mind, but in your heart, where everything is driven by relationship. Where you begin to feel the presence of other people rather than thinking about them. You can feel your brothers and sisters. You can feel your mother and father around you, beside you, close to you. You can feel and imagine all your friends, all your enemies, all the strangers in the universe, so that the whole of the earth is full of beings in human form. Human form is the only realm in which awareness of suffering can lead to the motivation to be free from suffering. And suffering is something that comes when you grasp or when you decide you don't like something or when you really hate something. And when you just become aware of those emotions and realize they're interchangeable and realize that, you know, friends are interchangeable, you could have a friend who might be your enemy, you could have an enemy who might be your friend. In some sense, you begin to inhabit a space and a room where you just accept everything. You accept your age, you accept your identity, you accept your relationships, you accept the people that you belong to. You accept it all like whether it's good or bad, it is what it is, this is you. And at least, at the very least, being you is a miracle. Being you is an extraordinary blessing. And it's a oh, wonderful blessing for me to be sharing that space with you. That's what I do in the Michael Harding podcast. I kind of share this space. And when I'm starting, do you know, when I start to do the podcast, I spend about 40 minutes having, you know, stop and start, false starts, because I can't get going until I really feel a, a sense of focusedness that I'm with you in the room. I think that's what probably works in all radio or television or podcasting. A sense that you create a virtual space and that you're sharing it with the listener. And that from your point of view, you are really sharing it with me. And I'm going to begin today by sharing a little reading from that book, What is Beautiful in the Sky. In 1969, I was a teenager on a summer course learning Irish in Donegal, billeted in a little cottage of shadows. At midnight, I slipped out a bedroom window while the other students were sleeping. The banatee had long gone with her husband to their room at the rear of the house where they snored in harmony like two boats moored together. I walked the untarred road that meandered like a ribbon into the bog and towards a lake. I was bursting with not just an unfocused love for all the girls in the summer school, in their summer skirts and blouses, but a love that made every blade of boggy grass and fern and heather a sensual delight. And in the dark, 
the faint tang of turf smoke lasted in the air like perfume. I was wondering what beautiful thing I might see or hear if I continued further out there into the dark. Perhaps I wanted God to hold me together as I waited for my intermediate certificate results, or perhaps I just needed a kiss. After walking past the lake and coming eventually to the shore, I heard a fisherman in his boat, lamping in the estuary, a grown man grunting and splashing in the silky black water. I remember the sound of his oars, sloshing in and out of the tide, and the wood creaking beneath the oarlocks as he landed. He was no more than a shadow in the distance, but later I saw him burning sticks and boiling a kettle on his fire and sitting there humming to himself some song I did not recognize. And I loved him like no other. I loved his authority and masculinity and his solitude and quietude, and especially the fact that he seemed to blend into the shadows of night and the inky ocean. He was at one with the entire universe. For a moment he was God, and he came back again and again in my life in the form of various teachers and lovers and beloved companions. But he was the original one, and I will never forget him. When the sun rose the next morning, I walked towards the schoolhouse, whistling so loudly that my fellow students wondered what was wrong with me. There was no point in telling them that I had ventured out at midnight and found such a mysterious presence. A presence so old it made me feel young, so close to air that it made my flesh feel more alive, a father so singular in his masculinity that it made me feel like a girl. And maybe that's why Donegal became the end of my story. And by the time Easter came around in 2020, three years ago, everything was in place for the ending. Now, for many, the ocean is full of ghosts, dead fishermen and loved ones lost at sea. But it also hums with life, seals and dolphins and things that swim in the dark. For me, it's the most comforting of places. When I stand on the shoreline, line, I feel that some remote presence in the depth is watching me. The shoreline is also a place people go when they want to mark significant moments, a place to say things like, I love you, or it's over, or I am not well. And I've always noticed that people who live beside the ocean make a lot of music, though they talk less than folk who live in the Midlands. I suppose the ocean's hum makes human discourse superfluous. At the shoreline, there's a vast elsewhere. It's above my head. It creeps up to my bare feet. It touches me with a presence so strong that I fall naturally into a state of attention and calm abiding. The world is different at the seaside or at the edge of the ocean. There's a sense of permanence a sense of some presence beyond us which goes on for longer and from which we came and to which we will some day return. And so one autumn morning, a few weeks after Tom McIntyre's death and his funeral, I was with the beloved in a Donegal hotel sucking a slice of lemon that came with the darn of salmon for breakfast. I was staring out at the ocean. My daughter was on the other side of the world, creating her own narrative, 
and the sweep of the white waves crashing against the black rocks appeared familiar. There was nothing at all significant about the morning, and yet the sea and the rocks appeared familiar, as if I had been calling myself home for years. Do you remember the house we stayed in seven years ago? I asked the beloved. It was an old-fashioned house in Ranifest and had been up for rent in the summer of 2013. She remembered well. We had been driving on the road between Guidor and Dunlow in July of that year, and the sky was so blue we'd stopped at a filling station for diesel, and I'd said to a man behind the counter that I'd love to find somewhere to holiday for a few days. Actually, I have a cousin, he said, who might rent you a house. When I'd returned to the car, I was holding a piece of paper with a phone number, and she'd asked me what was wrong. What would you say to a week up here by the seaside, I wondered, because we had been on the road home after a reading that I had done the night before in the Errigal Festival. It was one of those spontaneous things that surfaces sometimes without any plan or forethought. That afternoon the beloved and I had stood on the sand dunes where the grass cut our toes and the sea holly was silvery green, and we had chatted with a volunteer in a high-vis jacket who was helping direct traffic in the car park behind the sand dunes, and he had spoken to a woman whose husband was once in a band with a man in the high-vis jacket. We'd inquired about people I once knew in the locality, and we were told what is always told, that the old ones are all dead and gone and the young ones turning grey. And then we headed for Ranifast. The woman who was renting the house had been waiting. We spoke Irish. I told her that I'd once spent a summer at the Irish college, and I mentioned my Bannantee's name, and that I still remembered her with affection. It's a small world, the woman had observed. Why, I wondered. Well, she said, your Bannantee was my aunt. The house you're about to rent is where she came from. We had found the house by accident, but... Sometimes it's hard to resist magical thinking. The possibility that in the wider shape and contour of the unfolding universe there are no accidents. Sometimes there's something that is always calling us home. And that was in 2013. But four years later, we began looking again for a house in Donegal this time to purchase. We didn't find one, and in 2018 I had a heart attack, which seemed to finish off that adventure. So as I nibbled at the darn of salmon on my breakfast plate in Donegal, in a hotel in 2019, I began another casual but fateful conversation with the beloved by mentioning the house. What about it, she asked. Well, I says, it's up for sale. Is it, she said her face opening with astonishment. Yes, I said, it's a holiday home now. Well, perish the thought, she said. That's the last thing we need. I agreed, and we couldn't afford it anyway, I said. But on the other hand, she said, we always need workspaces. Oh, we do, I agreed, we do. We need a workspace, all right. We need to put everything we have into it, she said. Oh, we would, I agreed. And we left it at that, and I pondered on the word workspace, a place to work and dream and create new stories, a place for both of us to start again, to, to begin again, writing, sculpting, taking everything from the beginning once more. At our age, in our late sixties, it was a ridiculous idea and completely magical. We were back in Leitrim that evening before we spoke about it again. I suppose an artist's main responsibility is to work, I mused, and a workspace might be very beneficial. Now you're talking, she said, and she smiled at me like Sarah smiled at Abraham. 
or like an elderly couple might smile when they stumble on the unchanging wisdom of old age. But heaven, in any language, is about being here now. And that love itself is a kind of empowerment. There was no other counsellor in the room to advise us against it. On the night we decided to commit ourselves to one more adventure in the hills of Donegal. And that's where the, the reading ends. And when I read it now about myself and the beloved dreaming of having a nice little house in Donegal, you know, beside the sea, and how beautiful that would be. And that was in, in 2017. And in the six years since then, oh Lord, I have been through a fair few bits of stormy water with health issues, with heart attacks and operations and all that. But it, it just, it shows me when I read back how little you can plan of your life, you know. You think your life is going to be shaped out by your decisions, and in some sense it's not. In some sense, life is what happens to you. And I think I feel the same about love. I was saying, I was on television with Dahi yesterday, Dahi and Maura, the Today Show on RTE One, and I was saying that, you know, love is not a verb. When you're young, you're like that. When you're young, to love the other person, you get obsessed with the other person. You want to buy them things, you want to flatter them, you want to be, you know, physically and sexually capable and impressive, and it, it, it's all about, like, kind of nearly wanting them. You call it desire, and you can't sleep at night because you're thinking about them. And then, as you get older, love becomes a different experience. You realize, if you are in a long-term relationship, that love is simply being present to someone else. You become the guardian of the other person's dreams and hopes and joy. You kind of create a space around which the other person is able to be. And so you're the space that is kind of almost minding, garrisoning the otherness of the beloved. And you watch her joy is your joy. And you, you see that most particularly when you see a mother with a baby and the baby is there happy and the mother is like completely conscious and yet not an ounce is conscious of herself. Her consciousness has completely enveloped the activity of the baby, not herself. She has left herself. She has gone beyond herself. She has left herself, as St. John of the Cross says, forgotten among the lilies, and she's gone out into the night. The dark night for her is not dark. It's, it's the clarity of her infant, her little baby. And I think the mother's love is a template for all love. You know, that sense where the, mon the mother feels that she's abandoning herself for the presence of this child and that her attention is so completely on the child that she's not even thinking about herself having an existence. I think that's love. It's a template, it's a kind of a representation of love that works in every situation. It's not just about women and it's not just about mothers. If if I can't do that, if I can't create a space in my mind, my consciousness, around the beloved, around the woman in my life that I call the beloved, then I can't love. And, you know, wanting somebody is, is just your desires. And very often people are disappointed in love because they see love as just you know, desiring and then getting. So I want that woman, I reach out and grasp and I get. 
It, it never works for long, you know. The sense of love is always the sense that... It's like another thing I was saying yesterday when I was talking on the television. Love, you think that you're going to find love, but eventually love finds you. And it finds you like this discovery. It's like something landing inside you and you kind of, you realize you've been visited. And it's like a space around you. So it's like, it's, it's like this room around me at the moment. Now there's, there's kind of grey, purpley wall, not grey purple, grey green wall. And then there's a completely grey wall and there's a door out into the corridor and there's a big bed in the room. The usual furniture that you'd get in a hotel room, that's what's around me. And I can move through that room as if those things didn't exist, as if they were inanimate. I, I wouldn't notice what was in it. Somebody might ask me later, well, what colour was the wall in your bedroom? And I'd say, I don't know, I don't remember, because I didn't pay it attention. Now I'm, I'm paying it attention. I will remember this if somebody asked me as a quiz in two days' time, what was the colour of the wall in the bedroom in Cork? I would be able to tell them. So that's a funny thing, that we can live in the world without paying attention to what's around us. And we're always surrounded. We're always surrounded on three, four sides and above us and below us. We're always surrounded by something. There is always an environment, an envelope in which we exist. And to some extent, you don't notice it most of the time, unless you pay it attention. And what I'm feeling very often is that paying attention to the room you're in allows you to be present, allows you to, in some sense, your consciousness begins to inhabit the room. And to some extent, you begin to feel that that consciousness is not in your body. It's like you can sense the volume in the room, the air in the room, the space in the room. And you feel that as you become aware of it. It's like, it's like your consciousness is not like a fist that reaches out. Your consciousness seems to expand outside you. And becoming aware of the four walls around you is like, it's like your consciousness expands to absorb the walls around you. Now you are the room. You feel yourself the room. You are the space. And you are conscious of, it's like you're now conscious of yourself from the outside. You're more conscious of the posture, the way you're sitting. You're more conscious of breathing. You're even more conscious of thoughts going through your mind. You become conscious of yourself. As, you're, as your consciousness, as you've paid attention to the room around you, and as your consciousness has gone out, not to grasp the room or control the room, or, but just to absorb the room. And as you absorb the room in your consciousness, there's a way whereby the balance is tilted towards the outside so that you're now experiencing yourself as if you're walking through a room. So your conscious mind seems just ever so slightly outside your body. You've extended your consciousness. And now you walk. This is a very, very graceful way to be in a room. This is the way of Tai Chi. So that the body, when it moves through the air, is not forcing itself through the air, but is like being watched. You're watching your body move through the rig through the air, the room, the space. 
and that's more graceful. And it's also very beneficial in meditation. It's simply a process of becoming aware of your whole being, your your body, your speech, your mind, your thoughts, all that is about you within the confines of your physicality becomes in some way watched by your higher self, by the consciousness that is in the room. And one of the one of the ways to get there, to achieve that sense of what I think would be called calm abiding, is to use the room around you. To begin to see the walls around you as if they were just cherishing you. As if they were protecting you, as if they were holding you in this space. And then this space becomes like a womb, I suppose, like a womb. I've often done that now as a meditation, and I've often found it very, oh, very, very enriching. You just feel it like a womb. The room is holding you. And your consciousness becomes expanded from just your own body to a sense of your awareness holding your body I've, I found this very useful as well when I try to think about prayer in the Christian in the Christian way there is an amazing idea about being in the womb of Mary. It's an idea that I heard one time from a priest on YouTube. He, he was a Coptic priest. Don't know if he's still alive. I hope he is. Or if he's not still in this realm. I hope he has gone to the realm of eternal peace. His name was Father Lazarus. And he was, he was a philosopher, and he was somebody who, you know, grew up as a, a secular atheist in the sense that, you know, he didn't engage with religion. He was a very modern young lad, dysfunctional family, I would think. Gave himself to philosophy, became a big philosopher, would lecture in Australia or in Canada, different places. And he was... He was going around somewhere in, I think, Croatia, I'm not sure, maybe Serbia, I'm not sure. One day he was visiting, doing a tour, giving a lecture at some conference, and he's walking along the street, and out of the blue, he's passing an Orthodox church, and he gets this urge to go inside. So he goes inside, and as he opens the door... Way down at the far end on the iconostasis, just above it, there is this huge big icon of the Mother of God, Mary holding the infant Jesus. And he is drawn to it. And he walks down, and it wouldn't have been an aisle, because in Orthodox churches they don't have seats and aisles like we do in the West, in Western Christian churches. So he walks anyway down this big space in this church right to where he's underneath the icon and he prostrates himself. He goes flat on the floor in the, in the way that he feels he's been drawn to this mother image. And this is a guy who hadn't a good relationship with his mother. It was dysfunctional. And a guy who had grown up very secular, very like modern and erudite and no time for religion and still there was some draw in him and he came to this moment and he just stretched himself on the ground he describes this now on a youtube video if you want to go look for it father lazarus and he he's on the ground then and he, he draws up his legs underneath him so that he gets into the fetal position 
And now he's lying there on the stone slabs in front of this big icon in a fetal position. And he says he imagined that he was a speck like an infant, like a baby, like a like a tiny thing in the womb of Mary. And that not just the church, but the earth and the solar system and the galaxy and the universe, the whole cosmos, was the womb of Mary. So you need to get your head round that visualization. You need to you need to think about how big the universe is, you know, how I think there's four hundred billion stars in our galaxy. Four hundred billion. Four hundred thousand million stars with little planets in our galaxy. And that our galaxy is only one of trillions of galaxies. Would you stop? It's hard to get the mind round the sense of how much space, matter, material there is in the cosmos. And and so you think of of all that is material as the womb of Mary. And there he is like a little speck inside it. Now that, in, in some sense, that helps me to understand my relationship with the world around me. It helps me, first of all, to realize that if I'm if I'm doing a show in Cork tonight in the Everyman Theatre and if I'm in a hotel bedroom this morning at this time, that's just the little world from my point of view. That's just like my little narrative. If if I have to go and do a talk tomorrow in some particular hotel and I think of myself in those terms, or I think of, you know, what is the day for me? T- today is going to the everyman. Tomorrow is going somewhere else. So I'm thinking of reality in terms of my little narrative, my tiny little narrative, which means nothing. I mean, my life will pass, and hundreds and hundreds of years will go on for billions of people and I am forgotten, a speck of dust. And yet I'm thinking of the experience of here and now from my point of view as if that mattered, as if that was important. I, and, and it is. I'm trapped in this ego, and I think it is important. And that's the way I see the world. And that's the way I see this room. It's me. It's always me. So when I start this practice of... Firstly, paying attention to the room and thinking about the colours on the walls and the details of the furniture. And when I start thinking of, of being present in that way, within that space, within those four walls, and I could do this just as easily outside if I was sitting on a bench by the ocean or if I was sitting in a woodland area. I mean, no matter what, what space I'm in, space means that there is a graph a 360-degree circle around me. So no matter where I am, I can have this sense of being present and then paying attention to the space that I'm in. And when I do that, I will gradually find that my consciousness is not kind of grasping the walls or kind of pushing itself out, but it's it's sort of embracing the walls. It's sort of finding a relationship with the wall. I'm, I'm aware of the wall being in front of me. I'm aware of the furniture in the room. And this sense of awareness grows if you do it for 30 minutes. And it grows to the point where you become aware of 
thoughts going through your mind, of positive thoughts, of negative thoughts. You become aware of of your body as you breathe, as you sit, as you maybe particularly if you sit with a straight back. And so now you're aware in the room. And then I push it this little further. I begin to to feel, if you like, to feel the walls are actually having a relationship with me. That in some sense they are protecting me. Now this is true because if you could imagine me here with no walls, no room, no ceiling, no roof, no floor, well, I would be standing exposed to the elements and it might be raining outside. So, in a very practical way, the room is protecting me. And if you're in the open air, then that open air is blessing you with, with light and with all sorts of wonderful gentle breezes. So the sense of having a relationship with the environment around you is a very real experience. And in Tai Chi, you're simply bringing that consciousness in a focused way into your movement. Most of the time, I walk through rooms without even noticing what's there, unless it's useful or relevant to my little narrative. But if I become more and more aware of the room that I'm in, I become aware of my body, myself, moving through the room. I'm aware of myself, physically. I'm aware of the room enveloping me. And then I begin to feel the room is minding me. The, you know, the environment I'm in is giving me, it's giving me air, it's giving me light. There's a huge aspect to being me, which is, which is really passive, which is really kind of absorbing and responding to the environment I'm in. And in fact, I wouldn't be here were it not for 14 billion years of the cosmos and millions of years of evolution and, 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 all that time which brought forth this wonderful being called the human species, of which I am one. So I'm not here out of the blue, out of nowhere. I'm here because I'm just another clone of my father with slight variations, and he of his mother, and he she of her mother, and back infinitely, to the beginning of human evolution. And all that wouldn't have happened without the environment. So in a huge way we are definitely responding to the environment we live in. There's a definitely, definitely a kind of a physical way in which the environment is calling us out, drawing us out to become who we are physically. And then, finally, I tip the balance when I have got a good sense of consciousness in the room, a good sense of being aware of myself in the room. I think of the whole room itself as like a womb, like, like this, is, this is the mother. Every part of the cosmic materiality around me above me, below me, beside me, on my left, on my right. Everything is in some sense, I begin to imagine, the molecules, the atoms that constitute the womb of the Great Mother. I begin to see the Great Mother, the Mother of God, the incarnate, wonderful space of the cosmic as Mother. And I am in it. I'm softly, softly with my mother, no matter where I am, no matter in this hotel, 
walk in the streets at the edge of the ocean on a snowy day in Warsaw, no matter where I am, I'm always walking in some environment, and that environment is always the womb of my mother. And that, that I said the womb of Mary, this is an idea that I picked up, as I say, on YouTube from that Father Lazarus, a Coptic priest, but I say womb because, because I am becoming so I'm reading into the environment two layers of imaginal constructions. One layer is beginning to feel the sense that I'm, I'm actually, I'm in the womb. That the walls and the floor and the ceiling and the, and the trees and the, the ocean, everything, everything is kind of helping me, as if like the womb would be helping a, an infant. And the next layer that I put on that is where I think it's, it's helping me be me, because every time I create an action, I become a new person. That's why in Buddhism, you know, they have this idea that the bardo, that place between one life and another, that that bardo, that transitional space where you move from one life to another, they say that that's, that bardo exists in every split second. Because in every split second you have this potential to be new. Because everything is a new situation. You're in the bathroom and you see a spider and you can kill the spider or you cannot kill the spider. Every situation is a new moment of opportunity. And I was talking about in last week's podcast all about non-violence, ahimsa. And that non-violence is a potential step you can take in every moment, every second. Every second there's a, there's a bit of you that wants to clench the fist and be, be me, you know, be aggressive. It, it, it happens in your thoughts. You, you want to form thoughts that are negative and angry. It happens in your, in your actions. You want to brush past somebody to, you know, get the best table in the restaurant and you don't care about the other person. You walk through a door where there's a waiter and you just ignore them as if they didn't exist. These are ways of embodying a sense of, you know, violence in the world. And then there's, and then there's that sense of creating a sense of consciousness that that you're able to hold the space around you and be present to it and then realize that the space is present to you. The, the space is holding you. And you begin to feel your body and your mind as, as a constant rhythm of responses to a greater reality. And you begin to imagine, if you like, imagine like moving into an imaginal realm where where what looks like the wall, what looks like the world around you is actually the womb of the mother holding you, nurturing you so that every movement, every gesture, every thought can be a new life, a new beginning, a new moment of responding with a yes to love. And that's where I get to the bit about love about love. The imaginal realm is not a literal truth. I know that the wall is a wall. But the very fact that you're able to transform in your imaginal mind the four walls into a living, breathing womb 
a physical space within which you are safe and loved, the very fact that you can do that is a wonderful facility that humans have to imagine. Probably it is what makes us human, I don't know. Do you know what I mean? That that maybe other animals have just as much consciousness as we have, but they're trapped in the present moment and they're trapped in the reality as they perceive it. And they don't have that little flip in their mental capacity to actually transform reality by imagining. Or, to put it another way, transform reality by seeing deeper than the surface and seeing into the imaginal realm. Because when I think of myself in the womb of Mary as I walk along the street, I think of it as real. I, I let myself cross the threshold between this world, which is, as I perceive it, very solid and real, and on the other side of that threshold is the imaginal realm where everything has the possibility to be metaphor. It's an extraordinary choice you have when you, when you step over that threshold in the imagination because you can step over the wrong threshold. You know, you can step over the, the negative and constantly imagine yourself in enemy territory, which a lot of people, I think, do. And they sit down at the table... Uh, they go into a restaurant, or they go into a business meeting, they go into their work, and everywhere they go, they feel they are in enemy territory. And they behave with a kind of sharp, a sharp mind that cuts through things, it's a kind of an aggressive thing, a muscularity, you might call it. But the other way is to, to step over the threshold where you you imagine you far from being in enemy territory when you're lying on your bed when you're sitting in your room when you're walking alone you are not in enemy territory you are in the womb of Mary the womb of the great mother which which you perceive with your limited eyesight and your limited consciousness as hard reality even science has, has shown us that that's not entirely the case, you know. You analyse the, the atoms in the wall and you find that it's mostly empty. It's hardly more than a, a pulsation. So our perception of reality is in itself just limited to our evolutionary ability to shape reality and form reality in a way that we can survive in it and it's meaningful for us. I know this is a room. When you cross the threshold of into the imaginal realm in the positive, one of the great contexts within which to begin to feel your being alive is that you are walking being, breathing, you are in the womb of the Great Mother. It's to say that you're minded and cared for, that's all. It's to say that you're loved in every moment. And you might say, well, you know, it's impossible to do that because I have a difficult life. I suffer from a particular illness. I suffer from a mental distortion. I suffer from abuse. I suffer from, you know, injustice. I there's so much suffering in everybody's life. It's a great Buddhist teaching that there's so much suffering. But then the next step in Buddhist teaching is there's a way out of suffering. There is a way out of suffering. And in Buddhism, is it, 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 they would say it's to take refuge, to take refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. The Sangha being the community, the solid community around you that loves you. Now, the, sa the Sangha, you know, f in kind of traditional terms, the Sangha means the ordained community 
of reliable Buddhists who have penetrated the mystery of ignorance and they are reliable and secure people to connect with. So you connect with the Sangha. But I think that in in the world that we live in, which is 2,000 years, 2,500 years after the Buddha, in the world we live in, it would be fair, in my feeling, to say that the Sangha, for me, my church, if you like, is my family. My parents, my children, my companion, my beloved, my siblings, my friends. This is my Sangha. So I take refuge in the Sangha always as a primary thing. And the Dharma, taking refuge in the Dharma in, in old-fashioned religious tradition, obviously they mean the, the teachings. Ultimate reality. Penetrating ignorance and, and recognizing ultimate reality in Buddhist terms. That's the Dharma. And I, I accept that in my life as the, the ground of what that phrase means, but it expresses itself in different ways contextually. So that, for example, because I'm a Christian, for me the Dharma is the traditional teachings of the Christian churches, including Buddhist Dharma, and including other teachings of, of wisdom that have come to us through secular traditions, particularly through psychotherapy, but also through philosophy. I mean, I couldn't, oh sure, I couldn't live without the beautiful, wonderful philosophies of the 20th century in, in Europe alone. And I don't know much, of about, much about them, but I mean, I revere the philosophical insights. So all that I would consider dharma, and you take refuge in those things. You don't make up your own opinions. You don't make up your own attitudes based on prejudice. You just go and read some wise people, like whether it's Tehar de Chardin or some great, you know, the Dalai, the Dalai Lama's books or... Uh, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila. Who, it's all the Dharma. It's all wise teachers who have written down stuff. And that's always better than my own opinion. So that's to take refuge in the Dharma for me. That's the Sangha and the Dharma. And the, the really big one, the primary one, is to take refuge in the Buddha. Who or what is the Buddha is just impossible question to address but I'm sort of going around it today by talking about this journey this meditational journey whereby you become conscious of the space that you are in you hold the space in your conscious mind and gradually that tips over to a point where you feel conscious as if you were the room aware of your own body. You have, you've got outside your own body in this conscious moment. And you are aware of yourself moving through the room. And then you, you begin to move across the threshold into the imaginal realm where you realize you are in the womb of Mary. You are in a loving embrace with the mother. And that's a calm place to be for me anyway. And I think that that is love. It's interesting too that bodhicitta, compassionate mind, is, is, is very like in the Buddhist tradition it, it's very like what we, we would call love in the Christian tradition, bodhicitta. And, and both Islam, Christianity, Buddhism, they will all speak about the manifestation of God 
it's kind of synonymous with the manifestation of love. It's best expressed by John's Gospel, where he, he says, God is love. We read that in the West, in Europe, and we just don't hear it. Because if we did hear it, we wouldn't have all the conversations we do about atheism and about, you know, whether there is a God or not. We forget that in the Gospels, they they abandon the word God and say God is love. Wherever you find love, that's God. So what I'm working on this morning is this template, if you like, of being present in a room, being here in this room, and feeling the embrace of the room when I am still and when I have calm abiding, when I'm aware of my breath, when I'm aware of my mind, the thoughts flying through it, when I sit still, keep the back straight, do that for 30 minutes and you will be so aware of the room. And when you carry that out onto the corridor and you're walking into a restaurant or you're walking into to meet somebody in a shop or a supermarket, and you still have that sense of space around you. And that all things are loving you, cherishing you, minding you, holding you. There are no enemies. Even the people who appear to be enemies are actually people who love you but haven't realized yet that they love you. So they haven't evolved yet enough, but they're on their way. And you can help them. You can help them become enlightened. But all enlightened being around us is the shared experience of love which begins to transcend individuality and isolation. To know that you are not isolated. You are not alone. You are, you are not... You know I go through loneliness. You know I go through a sense of isolation. If you listen to this podcast, you know well that I feel all those things. So I feel lonely, even though I'm saying that there's a space we need to find where we are not lonely. And maybe, maybe there's a balance here. You know, maybe when I talk about feeling that you're in the womb of Mary and that you are loved and cared for and that everybody around you cherishes you and that and that if they don't, if they appear that they don't cherish you, it's only an appearance. They haven't realized that they do cherish you. But when they come to full awakening as a Buddha, they will cherish you. And my teacher, the great Rinpoche, Panchen Uttral Rinpoche, he always says, we hope, hope to get to enlightenment together. Like, we're all going to get here together. That's, that's a really lovely idea too. You know, that whatever heaven there is, it, it's not for me. I will not get there without you. Your awakened self, which you may not be aware of, and my awakened self, which I'm definitely not aware of, but but deep within us is a cherishing of each other. Deep within us is a kind of a, a light, which is the one light. We are the one thing. Not only is the is the whole environment cherishing you like a mother, but but even deeper than that imaginal template of mother, womb, child is the realization that that it's all one single light or energy anyway. I am like something expressing itself, an aspect of the same thing that you are. So that Buddhist idea of awakening to unity, awakening to love, 
that is within us. That's where you end up when you start thinking about the Mother of God. Because you're thinking about this sense that the whole cosmos is minding you, loving you. As Psalm 139, I think it is, says, you know, I knit you together in your mother's womb. I counted every hair on your hand. The love of knowing you, of like, you are made of the same stuff as I am. We are so deeply cherished. We are so deeply loved. Love awakens in us. That's a Buddhist teaching, it's a Muslim teaching, it's a Jewish teaching, it's a Christian teaching. There is nothing but love everywhere. Even though sometimes it comes in the wrong clothes. It is masked and you don't you don't see it as love. But underneath everything is love. And the way this works for me is if you think of that space around you that you get when you meditate, when you when you get a, a kind of a sense of awareness of the whole space around you, and you, you, you go over the threshold and you begin to think like like that you're actually in the womb of Mary, that you're you're just being cherished like a like a mother in her womb is minding her child. And you feel that and you experience that. Okay, translate that then into the relationship you have one-to-one with adults. So, so love is actually creating the space in which the other one breathes. It's like being a mother to your lover. Male or female, doesn't matter. What does it matter if you're male or female? Love one male to male, female to female, whatever. Let's be fluid. Let's be free about who we are. Let's not get hung up on categories. But when you have your eyes looking at the beloved, the other one in the room. And you are still, and you are in meditative, calm abiding. And your your consciousness is absorbing the other person. So you're listening to them, you're paying attention to them. You're being like a mother. You're nurturing them so that the next second in their life will be the most beautiful. Can I make the next moment for you be a moment of beauty? That's you being a mother, whether you're male or female. And and you don't have to... I don't mean a mother in real life, but just... There's something deep in you and me, metaphorically, that is mother. And there's another wonderful Tibetan teaching on this one. And that is where you contemplate every single human being you meet as a mo- what they call a mother being, a mother being that, that the next person that walks in this door or if I go out on the corridor and go downstairs into the hotel, the next person that I meet, in some former life, that person was my mother. Not a beautiful idea. It's a Tibetan Buddhist idea. Everybody was my mother, male or female, doesn't matter. Not only male or female, but, but even beyond humans, every sentient being that you experience and encounter with. From the little tiny ant on the ground or the bee and the flower or the bird in the sky or, or the pet cat 
or dog. Every being was in, in some form or life. Your mother. And that connectivity of motherhood coming towards you in every single encounter with other sentient beings. It's a beautiful, beautiful Tibetan Buddhist meditation. All beings are mother beings. There is nothing but mother. And here you come back to Julian of Norwich, who keeps talking about God as the great mother. Not Mary now as the mother of God, which is the you know, the perfect formal template within the Christian iconography. But when Julian of Norwich is speaking of God, she talks about the motherliness of God. And that motherliness is all around us, all the time. And the only thing that, that diminishes it or pushes it away is my ego. So therefore contemplating the motherliness of all being and all reality and the cosmic material of the universe, contemplating it is a way that draws me out of living within my own ego, allows me through the imaginal realm to live more deeply in relationship with everything around me, with the room around me, with the people who walk in the room, and with my beloved, and with my girlfriend, my boyfriend, or with my daughter, or my son, or my mother, or my father, my brother, or my sister. It allows me to work with them as like, I'm creating an awareness within which they are present. I'm paying attention to them when they speak. I am the universe around them. I am their mother wishing that I could make the next second in their life the most beautiful experience they ever had. How can I do that? Answer, just be still. Be still. And you will find that it's a wonderful way to combine romantic intimacy, loving intimacy, human intimacy, to combine it with meditation. The very presence of the other person in the room no longer distracts you from meditation, but actually becomes the focus. Like as you might focus single-pointedly on a candle in your meditation, so therefore you focus on the other person in the room, single-pointedly. Because you, you're aware of the room, your consciousness has filled the room, has embraced the room, is the room. You are the room where they walk. Mother does this with her child in, in literal, real terms, Mother does that with child all the time, no problem. Forgets herself with her attention to the child. We do it with our partners when we say we love them. It's not a verb, love is not a verb. We love them simply by being aware, conscious, being a motherly space around them in which they can be joyful. We pay them attention. And when we are alone, when we are lonely, when we are sad, and we practice this sense of spatial meditation, and then when we cross over the threshold into the imaginal realm, then do we experience God's presence as eternal law minding us and hoping that every bardo experience, every transitional moment will be a new beginning and one of that recognizes God's love in it. All that, all that, 
all that wonderful imaginal stuff about the mother of God, about being in the mud, in the womb of the mother, feeling safe, feeling cosy, feeling protected. All those feelings can be so nourishing when you're lonely. They can draw you out of your loneliness and allow you to feel a joy that you are deeply loved and that love is not in the future, it's right now in the present moment and it's not somewhere in an invisible world. It's in the very walls of the room around you. It's in the faces of the people you meet. It's in the flowers, it's in the trees, it's in the the whole flowering of the cosmos, physically. It is all actually the womb of Mary assuring you of the fact that you are loved. And that is what May is about. The month of May. The festival of the Great Mother, which you can have in Tibetan Buddhist terms as celebration of Tara, the white Buddha, the female Buddha. You can have it in the Christian tradition as that great Mother of Jesus, Mother of God, becoming Mother of God. Queen of Heaven. Or you can have it in a, a very special private experience like Julian of Norwich, where it's the ineffable love of God's presence coming at you. Every breath I breathe is given to me in this womb of love. Every inhalation, every exhalation is given to me. I am not the air that comes into my lungs. And in many ways I don't choose the air that comes into my lungs. It simply comes and fills me and nourishes me like a mother. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you for sharing the space with me. Thank you for being here with me. And I hope next Monday is the 1st of May. I hope that you feel the presence of Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. I hope you feel her presence on the eve of that feast, and on the day, and for every day of May, as the flowers, the white flowers, appear on the May bush, I hope you feel you are in the womb of Mary, and she wishes you joy. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye.